Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Vermont House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development and the Vermont House Committee on Transportation. Um, this is a joint hearing um, between our two committees to uh, go over the report uh, to the legislature on towing practices in Vermont. And that's in accordance with Act 41 from last year. And I believe that was your transportation bill, Madam right. Chair. Um, so we're glad to be here. We have Chris Curtis from the Attorney General's Office uh, to go over the report to, with us. Um, we're here to listen to that, ask questions, um, uh, and um, see where we go from here after we hear the report. So anything you'd like to add? No, we're just very appreciative. Um, but it's really nice to be with the House Commerce uh, Committee and look, looking forward to our time together. Very good. Chris, it's welcome. Thank you for coming this afternoon and look forward to hearing your report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, <clears throat> members of your respective committees. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedules uh, to learn more about towing practices in Vermont and across the country. Um, for the record, my name is Christopher Curtis. I'm the uh, director of the Consumer Assistance Program at the Office of the Attorney General. So that is the place in our office where we receive consumer complaints, try to deal with them as quickly and effectively as we can to help both uh, consumers, individuals, and businesses to resolve their disputes. So um, I'm very grateful to have been afforded this opportunity. This is a really interesting area of law and practice. And at the outset, uh, maybe let me take a step back and give you just a 50,000 foot you know, evaluation of what this report represents what it is and what it is not in terms of the menu of recommendations that are ultimately before you. Um, this is, uh, and before I even do that, um, let me just commend the various stakeholder groups and parties who participated in the process. Um, that includes our sister agencies across state government, but more importantly, it includes um, representatives from the um, towing association, uh, tow individual uh, towers themselves, uh, ordinary Vermonters uh, that have questions or concerns about this area, um, and advocates uh, for consumers generally. So uh, a lot of interested parties and a lot of interest in the topic, but we can't do our work to understand the industry or to learn uh, the full scope uh, and impacts of any particular issue area if we don't have meaningful participation from all of the parties who are affected, that helps us. And ultimately, I hope that that helps you to come to some conclusions um, about whether or if uh, any particular action uh, might be either necessary or required or helpful. So um, we had a robust um, collection process. We encouraged everybody to submit their perspectives um, or background or research in writing. All of that information is available on the Attorney General's website. If you go to our consumer action link, um, you'll see on the sidebar, there's a towing practices link and you can review all of the material that was collected and the public hearing that was held on the topic. So you can actually watch the discussion uh, unfold. So if any of you are interested in that or if any viewers are interested in that, you can find the material, uh, the source materials and you can find the hearing at that, at that location. Um, so with respect to the, the contents of the report itself, and we'll walk through the report because I want you to have a, a full briefing of it, and then hopefully that will spur you know, questions, discussion among you all as well. Um, this is not a report that focuses on regulating an industry. As you may understand, formal regulation uh, pursuant to the powers of the Secretary of State and its Office of Professional Regulation. Um, that process is typically uh, started by, um, you know, either a request by industry or a request from other parties or even state government stakeholders um, to look into whether regulation is necessary or appropriate. And it typically commences with a sunrise review process. So there's a series of public hearings, stakeholder meetings, and it really gets into the question of, you know, is regulation required? Is there a showing of enough arms or concerns or impacts that would warrant uh, strict regulations. And that could be one of any three types, right? It could be a simple registration requirement. 
Um, it could be a certification requirement or it could be a licensure requirement. This report is not attempting to uh, go down that road. That is the purview and province of the Secretary of State. And it may be that at some point in the future, if industry is interested in that, um, or if other parties are interested in that, that could be its own process to determine whether or if there should be some qualification for operating um, in this space. But what this is, is a look at what are the best practices across a number of jurisdictions? What are the best practices currently deployed in Vermont? Um, what are the standards existing in Vermont law? Um, and what's the right shape, size effort of trying to, as in considering all of those elements, um, you know, is there a, a menu of recommendations that can be presented to you all for consideration that might ameliorate some of the concerns that we've heard as we've um, engaged in, in the process? Um, so any questions about our process or any of that sort of high level background? Senator Campbell? Yeah, just one question. It, it, does the Secretary of State have purview to, to order a Sunrise report or is that something that the legislature needs to request? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't, it's typically not, I don't think, sua sponte. I suppose it, it might be. Um, it might be at the request of lawmakers. Um, it, but again, that would be a question more properly directed to the Secretary of State's okay. office, um, just because that really is their lane and the Attorney General's office doesn't really delve okay. into that. It's typically okay. a process that they, um, either by request or by design, you know, they, they deploy. Okay. So whether if that's appropriate, you know, we did hear some... Um, you know, testimony or some discussion around, you know, should there be, you know, some states I think have some minimal qualifications or, you know, background checks for drivers of, of these operators. And so we're starting to get into that area that gets more into the question of regulating the industry and are there minimum qualifications required to engage in the activity itself? Okay, thanks. Just, um, <clears throat> just so everyone knows and for people that are listening in or watching, um, this report is, um, is on our uh, House Commerce webpage. Um, so you can pull that up uh, anytime you and like. On the transportation and it's on House Transportation as well, their webpage. So it's available now if anybody wants to look at it. The other thing I would like to orient the members to and any viewers to is the nature of the report itself. This is about a 10-page 10, 10 report or so that gives a, a broad overview and set of recommendations based on um, all of the materials collected and probably 40 or 50 pages of appendix, which is really a comprehensive uh, look at other states and other jurisdictions and everything that they do. So this is not a new question or a novel question that's being presented. Many, many other states have looked at this issue and there are national scale reports that look at the panoply of laws in place um, or not in place across the rest of the country. So rather than trying to recreate those kinds of reports, um, you can find them in the references in the report itself, or you can look at the appendix to see a comprehensive, you know, state by state grid of um, the, the statutory uh, requirements of those jurisdictions. But I've tried not to recreate that because I want to be clear and relatively brief and to the point uh, about what we learned through the process as opposed to just recreating one of these other reports that already exists. So that's part of the explanation for the length and duration of the report itself. Um, one thing I, I, I note um, too is Vermont has a long history and tradition of consumer protection in our state. We have a wonderful Consumer Protection Act and um, you all have engaged over the years in trying to ascertain <laughs> when and, and whether and if to uh, deploy certain kinds of best practices in many, many other industries. Most recently, you might recall, there was an effort to do this um, in the home improvement contracting area. So some minimal elements, not heavy handed regulation, but minimal elements to say, this has been an unregulated industry heretofore. There's an interest in preserving the balance between the um, you know, the, the industry uh, and, you know, the people who are accessing the industry. Um, but there's not a desire to put anyone out of business or to uh, create such a burden that it becomes impossible to act. Um, what I think you've attempted to do, whether it's rent to own, contractors, um, 
you know, any number of different areas, you've tried to strike a balance. And I heard that in the request for the report was, is there a balanced approach that the legislature might consider um, to, to deploy and maybe consistent with other laws, um, bring some transparency um, and best practices to um, your constituents. And so that's another element of the report that you'll see is sort of scattered throughout references to other statutes, other places in Vermont law where you've done similar kinds of activities where prior to that, the industry itself might have been unregulated. So I want you to note that there's an effort uh, on our part to sort of seek consistency rather than try to create something brand new. And I can tell you as a consumer protection attorney for the state, this often starts with disclosure, right? Transparency around like, what am I purchasing? What is the cost? <clears throat> What's fair and reasonable? Um, and so that was frankly a huge part of the initiative here was to determine what is, how do we strike a balance in terms of what's reasonable or not reasonable in the scope of, of towing. So that's all here as well. Um, so let me share my screen so people at home and so you all can see the towing report. Okay, great. So the first thing to know about um, towing practices in Vermont is there's very little regulation or very little statutory uh, law on the books in this area. Um, there are a few, um, for example, there's a $125 limit on towing from uh, abandoned vehicles from public spaces, for example. So that's a, that's a bright line. And that's a, a figure that was um, amended a few years ago. I think originally it was a $40 uh, fee. And um, my understanding of the history of that is there was a desire to uh, amend that to better reflect actual costs to the industry over time. And this is an important figure because we'll circle back to it in a little bit when we get to the recommendations. Um, there are uh, set out in the statute um, guidance that um, tows from highways um, or crash remedi remediation sites be reasonable. Um, and there is some case law discussing what is reasonable or not, but as you might imagine, that would probably be in some cases subjective, depending on whether you are the consumer or whether you are the business. Um, and it might ultimately be left to the courts to sort out um, whether something is reasonable or not. And it might be a very fact specific inquiry as to each and every type of tow um, and the nature of the tow. So it might be a non-consensual passenger vehicle tow, it might be a consensual commercial vehicle tow. It might be a tow um, from a crash remediation site. Um, all of those are different variables and might have different costs that attach to them. And they might require different equipment. So um, the question of what's reasonable in each and every context um, really may well be in the eye of the beholder. And that was one of the things that jumped out to us as we started to look at what are other jurisdictions doing in this area? Um, and it's a source of great discussion and debate uh, that we welcome. But very little on the books as it stands. Um, also, by the way, there are no um, statutory uh, requirements or uh, maximums for storage needs. Um, and I say statutory because there may be ordinances that have limitations on uh, both towing fees or um, storage fees. But in terms of like a uniform state law, <clears throat> nothing that's going to be consistent, no way for, you know, a consumer in Bennington to know that they're going to be treated the same in Newport, or treated the same in Burlington, treated the same in St. Johnsbury. So um, you don't have a uniform standard and some municipalities treat these differently than others. Um, and some are just silent. So again, you're going to get back into a reasonable test. Um, what can be proven? What were the actual costs? Um, and I think in part, um, all the parties have an interest in trying to say, is there a way to avoid um, creating conditions that are so um, polarizing that they somehow end up having to be litigated um, or that one party or the other feels so affronted that you've sort of broken a relationship or broken a community trust of some kind. So that's an effort to, uh, you know, clarification and creating some basic standards might be one way to address some of those issues as well. Um, 
There are references throughout the statute um, in Vermont laws to what constitutes a passenger vehicle and what constitutes a commercial vehicle, and there are federal and state standards on that. Um, I don't want to belabor it because you'll see as we move through the report that the basic gist of this report is really focusing on the common complaints that come to the attorney general's office or that we become aware of through other jurisdictions um, and locally, which primarily are driven by consumers, the individual consumer, not necessarily a, a business or a commercial entity. Um, that's a sort of a separate uh, discussion area, and it's a very real concern for all of the parties. But for the purposes of this report and in terms of identifying some best practices that can work for most of your constituents, we're focused primarily on passenger vehicles because those are the complaints that we get. Um, and the average consumer is going to be in a position of, in terms of, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the, the powers in play, they might be less sophisticated. They're not going to necessarily have a, a business behind them. They might not have access to counsel. Um, whereas larger, you know, commercial enterprises might have access to some of those things. Um, industry practitioners might have access to those things. So it's a, it's a different level of concern. Um, I will say the amounts at issue in those commercial cases are much larger than in the traditional consumer passenger vehicle context. So, um, but just note that um, some jurisdictions use a, you know, per pound per vehicle analysis to determine what's a passenger vehicle and what's a reasonable amount for a tow. Most passenger vehicles, though, you'll see here noted, you know, in the report, even for, you know, major trucks, uh, you know, pickup trucks and things like that, um, you know, they're going to be less than, if some statutes say less than 8,000 pounds, we're going to consider passenger less than 10,000 pounds. It's really almost less than 6,000 pounds for the most part, for most common passenger vehicles that you're going to find. That's not to say there might be an outlier somewhere there, but um, for the most part, that's what we're talking about. And of course, you all would have the power if you elected to act to determine kind of what threshold you might want to seek um, that would constitute a passenger vehicle. So you could look to those other standards at other jurisdictions, or you could get from DMV, what's the, you know, max average for passenger vehicles in Vermont. I'd happily share that with you, um, no doubt. Um, interestingly, at the public hearing, and this was telling too, because there was sort of some cognitive dissonance, um, I think for me, as I'm trying to think through, we had uh, just in the last year, the Consumer Assistance Program, um, about a couple of dozen uh, complaints related to towing. Um, and so I'm well aware of the kinds of the kind and scope and nature of the complaints that we get. I included an example in the report that kind of checked sort of a number of the boxes that, that you all might be concerned with. Um, but we don't typically get commercial complaints. And the Department for Financial Regulation, which of course regulates the insurance industry um, and, and you know, banking and, and might have, uh, they also have their own consumer assistance program. They might get calls from businesses or insurers that have questions in this area. And they said, we don't see a lot of complaints in this commercial area either. Um, so, but what was really striking was at the public hearing, um, there was a, a greater emphasis, it appeared to be on the commercial side of the question in terms of, um, how and when a towing owner or operator might be paid for a very significant expense that they're incurring for clearing a roadway with highly specialized equipment, or what happens with the merchandise that's being transported, and whether or if a third-party shipper who's not the owner of the vehicle but who has goods on there can retrieve uh, the, the items associated with, um, with that shipping, um, or how long or whether or if um, the vehicle can be held uh, to ensure that a payment is forthcoming, um, the length of time it might get take it might take to to get paid. Um, so all of those things were sort of fascinating because, um, from my perspective, like those aren't the complaints that we get on a, you know, fairly routine basis year in and year out uh, from the average consumer. Most of those tend to be non consensual passenger tows, passenger vehicle tows. Right, I parked in the wrong spot. The city called the tow truck, the tow came, and you know, pursuant to the contract, my car is gone. How do I find it? How much do I owe? How do I retrieve it? Um, can I retrieve my personal possessions from it? And so on and so forth. 
Um, those are the typical types of complaints that we receive. Um, and so it was just interesting to me. I think that there's a, um, a very interesting and complex question that looms for commercial parties in the context of serious and very expensive tows and crash remediation sites that involve you know, a, a level of complexity that is beyond most consumer tows. So just be aware of that because the report focuses on the kind of primary nature of complaints that are received probably by mo you know by you all as state representatives in your communities and certainly by state agencies but it's less focused on these perhaps bigger dollar bigger ticket items between the commercial players in that space and that's a really important um you know sort of holding point I want you to keep in your in your mind because I think that's going to be potentially outstanding and might be an ongoing conversation that needs to happen either among the parties or you know, potentially in the legislature at some point. So we looked at uh, best practices from other states. That was a logical place to go. And as I mentioned, there are plenty of national reports out there on this topic. You can see Appendix B um, provides you a very detailed a uh, graph that shows every jurisdiction across the country and gives you a statutory basis. And what you'll find in there is there are many of those other states, you know, maybe you know, half and half that either say there's no form of, you know, sort of maximum uh, tow assigned um, or some that say, well, there's a mix. It's either has to be reasonable, which is what Vermont, the Vermont standard is, or there's an actual cap. There's a maximum, you know, you shall charge no more than X. Um, in certain circumstances. And some of them get very detailed and some of them really get into the weeds of these commercial carriers. And how many specialized tow trucks have to arrive at the scene to get a semi off the road? And what's the weight or the value of the weight associated with those commercial trucks? I think in Vermont, given the number of towers that have that level of machinery and that level of expertise, there is a major outstanding question of what happens to ensure that there is payment for service in those cases? Um, and do you have a solid basis on which to intervene at this point to say, yeah, we could create a construct in Vermont that's similar to one of the other jurisdictions that has this very detailed analysis of each and every one of those costs? Um, we did not find that to be the case if, as yet, at least based on the evidence that, that we had. I want to give some credit to the um, tow operators, you know, who were explaining to us, there is a divide in terms of what's available in what part of Vermont at what time. And we don't want to find ourselves in a position where necessary equipment or necessary personnel might not be available to someone because um, somehow they can no longer perform under, you know, rates that might be pulled in, you know, just verbatim from another jurisdiction that might not work here. Um, because other states are larger and there might be more options um, for especially commercial carriers. Um, so, um, you know, I've already basically said, you know, the, the number of states that have some kind of fixed rate or don't. And, and this, this is an important consideration, too, because I think to the credit of um, some advocates and from consumers that have shared concerns with our office, um, the notion that each and every type of tow, especially if it might be sort of a standard non-consensual passenger vehicle, which is not typically going to require a lot of specialized equipment, it's not typically going to require two or three different types of tow trucks to arrive at a scene and remove it from a parking meter that's expired and you didn't pay your tickets or you parked unlawfully in a zone in the city. Um, I think other jurisdictions have demonstrated that in fact, there can be reasonable caps that can be deployed, that clear up the confusion um, or the lack of consistency um, in a place even like Vermont, where there might be some scarcity and even some municipalities. Um, but I think you could reasonably come to a conclusion that if you canvassed all the other jurisdictions, I think the national average was something like $109 for a standard non-consensual passenger vehicle tow. Um, I know in Burlington, the municipal ordinance is $95. There are other municipalities that have waded into this area with various caps. But I think you could reasonably say um, that the same standard established um, 
for an abandoned vehicle tow of $125 is not unreasonable to say for a non-consensual passenger vehicle, that could be the ceiling. That could be the limit. Um, and you don't want to preempt local laws that might have been operating just fine for years and years on a, either a contract basis or an agreed upon basis between a municipality and you know, a towing group. Um, so like in the case of Burlington, the 125, if you elected to create that, you'd be creating a unified, unified statewide standard, but you'd be saying not more than 125. And then the city could continue to maintain its ordinance and it would not upset that agreement. Um, but you could also uh, have other jurisdictions where it's never been regulated or where that municipality hasn't spoken on the issue. And they would then know, like, this is what the reasonable standard is. Um, so I think that's a way of, of kind of getting at this issue and saying, we've looked at the landscape, we can canvas that, we can come up with a reasonable amount. There is a construct already living in Vermont statute that says this is a reasonable limitation. And um, that's one of the recommendations for your consideration in this report. Yes. Hi, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so just a question, and I don't know if you did this analysis or not. Um, in cases where a town does set a maximum amount, do you see that that becomes the rate for towing? Or do you see that that is truly a maximum amount and the rates can vary below that? Well, it may depend. And the reason I say that- And is, I don't know if you did it. Yeah. you didn't research it, that's fine to say too. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. We looked at a number of municipalities to see what the maximum rates were. We did not canvas every single tower to see, do you skew to the rate or do you just operate somewhere within the rate? Um, or does it depend on the circumstances, which would be a good question. Um, and that's why I say, you know, if you're thinking about a statutory construct, you, you might say no more than $125. And that would allow flexibility for ongoing practice, um, or it would allow for existing <laughs> contracts um, potentially to remain in place. So it's a great question, and but we did not try to canvas every single, uh, you know, every every tow operator to see depending on the jurisdiction, are you, you know, how would you assess whether or not, I do think, I mean, what it says is there's a bright line standard. And so there's, there's clarity for those jurisdictions that have elected to do that. Um, but we just, we also know that that's not uniform throughout the rest of the state. And so I think a reasonable consumer might ask the question, why am I being treated one way in one jurisdiction and another way um, in another? And so if everything's falling below a, a ceiling, then at least you have a, you know, you have a space within which to work that everyone can understand and adhere to. Um, so we think that that's a, a reasonable um, reasonable place to look. Um, you will also notice that uh, I think there's a, an important legitimate consumer question around what's colloquially referred to as a drop fee. Um, and I think it's reasonable to hear from the, the towing association and people in the industry say, well, if we get a call out and we have to deploy, we're taking worker time away from, um, you know, from the, the business and we're sending them out on a call to pick up a, a car that's illegally parked. Um, that's our employee time, which has only gotten more expensive over the years. Uh, that's the cost of the equipment going out to the site. It might even be the cost of attaching the vehicle to the, the tow truck. But there is a question about some of those costs are, um, ameliorated if you don't, in fact, have to take the car away and bring it back to the lot and store it for some period of time because the consumer arrives on the scene and says, oh my goodness, I'm happy to you know, pay whatever fee there might be, but can you just release my car? Save me the trouble of going across town. Save you the trouble of taking up a space on your lot. Um, save me the trouble of having to find out where it ended up or getting transportation for myself to that unit. And a number of jurisdictions have addressed that and said a drop fee is reasonable. Um, here's what it is. Um, and you can um, identify that pretty quickly and easily and charge a sort of a nominal fee, but interrupt the removal of the vehicle or the dispossession of the vehicle from the consumer uh, on the spot. So that's another place to look to, another place to see other jurisdictions have done it. I don't think it's terribly foreign. It's not a foreign concept. Um, but right now, there's no regulation on point. So it's really up to the tower. And I think some consumers have been in the position of seeing the vehicle towed away um, you know, before their eyes and they sort of feel like, well, that's not fair. That's not right. I'm here, I should be able to retrieve my vehicle. Um, and there's a question to the extent that we're hearing, you know, industry doesn't want to absorb costs that they need to externalize. 
Um, if someone can pay it there on the spot, maybe that's a reasonable way to solve that problem and eliminate those kinds of disputes. Um, that seems reasonable. Um, storage fees, another very good example of a place where Vermont law is silent on the question of a uniform storage fee. Um, and I, I do think, you know, I, I recognize that um, towing operators have a wide variety of facilities. Some might have multiple lots, some might have one lot, some might have lots that have shelter and are covered, some might be open lots, um, some might have fencing around their lots, some may not. So there's a wide variety. I understand that. Um, on the other hand, you know, other states have also spoken to this issue. And I think even those that have, you know, just, just, you know, distinguish between, you know, a covered or an open lot and things like that, they all fall into a certain range. And you can see that. So I encourage you to look at the appendix, look at each state that does impose um, a reasonable storage fee and say, you know, we might clear up some confusion. We might set a standard. Um, and that would make it easier for everyone to know. On the question of storage, an important one is on the day that the vehicle is brought to the station or the owner's lot, does that constitute a storage day? Or is that just a removal day? And if somebody gets in there that day and pays the fee and it's gone within the span of an hour or two, is that really a full day of storage? Did they have to do anything to safeguard the vehicle, especially? Was there some kind of security that was deployed? Uh, there's, there's certainly not occupying a space on the lot for a terribly long period of time. So might be even within the storage fee context, if there's some agreement that that might be a place to look to, you might ask yourselves the question, does it make sense to create an... Uh, Burlington City Ordinance is another good place to look. They basically say, um, you know, the first day, the day of impoundment. Weird sound. I think we're getting a little echo. So we'll just pause for a moment. Yeah, hold on. Uh, control it on this. Who's the host? You mute yeah, it might be instructive. If there are other people watching online, if you can mute your um, devices, then um, we won't get the, the echo or the feedback. I was just going to point out to the members that um, it might be a consideration. Um, and again, ultimately, it's a policy decision that you all you know, will have to decide. But you might, um, you know, certainly a reasonable person could ask the question, if I'm there within an hour or two to get my car, is that really a storage fee day? Um, Burlington already sort of acknowledged, they say, well, the day of impoundment is $20, and then every day thereafter is $30. <clears throat> um, so the recommendation here is to say $25 seems reasonable, seems consistent with what a number of other jurisdictions have done. Um, private parking uh, per day is often much cheaper than that to begin with. Um, so for something like this, especially where there's incentive on the part of the consumer to go and get the vehicle pretty quickly, um, it just seems like that might be a place that's pretty ripe to sort of settle any outstanding questions, come up with a reasonable fee structure, maybe give, uh, a, you know, worth a little additional conversation with certainly with the, the industry, but could fair-minded people agree that maybe the first day, if you're there within a few hours, you can... That might be a place that's pretty ripe to sort of settle. I actually come up with a reasonable structure. Hearing you. You know, worth a little... Thank you, Representative. Um, so that might be a place for your consideration as well. Is just, is there a circuit breaker to say, we can save a little, get the car out a little quicker, save on the cost, there's not that much of a detriment to the industry, but set a standard so they know that they're going to get paid if there's a significant delay and they should be paid for the storage of the vehicle if it's gonna be, you know, take some time to retrieve it. Um, again, sort of a standard industry <clears throat> practice, if you will. Um, We had uh, testimony from various parties about various situations that might come up in the context of this situation was reported to our association or this situation was reported to, uh, you know, by a consumer. Um, I don't, I, I honestly didn't find the anecdotal um, stories as compelling because every single one is very fact specific or fact intensive. I shared one report we received from the, by the consumer assistance program because um, it actually illustrated like a number of the common elements all together in one vignette. So I'm hoping to try to crystallize for the committee what a common um, 
consumer complaint might look like, it was bundled into one. Each one might come to us at different times <laughs> with different parts of it, but it involved somebody, a passenger, involuntary passenger vehicle tow, um, where somebody was waylaid at the border, the vehicle ended up being towed. They were presented with the $850 demand for payment. Um, and were then told cash only. And I don't know about you, but I don't tend to carry $850 in cash with me. Um, so it really jumped out at me is that if that's a condition for retrieval and that the tension in industry is that they wanna be paid for services, making it easier for people to have the payment of their choice in commonly accepted forms, whether it's um, cash or credit or debit. Um, we put in the report, in the report by check. And what I mean by that is that um, it certainly might be true, and it's increasingly common that people have concerns about accepting personal checks because there's a question about whether the money is really there. But I think any reasonable business could say certainly a cashier's check is an acceptable form of payment. Certainly a money order is an acceptable form of payment. Those are essentially cash equivalents because you paid up front for the instrument. So I can't imagine what the... Uh, reason would be for a declination of a reasonable form of payment in commonly accepted practice. Um, and yet we hear kind of throughout, and as you see um, the canvas from other states, um, there are states that have not waded into this area, but then there are states that have said, yes, we live in a modern economy. Consumers should be able to pay. And we want the tow owners and operators to be paid. So there should be no reason why there should be a barrier or some sort of artificial reason why somebody has declined um, the payment in order to retrieve their vehicle. So really important, I think that's a, it's maybe a detail, but it came up in the context of this story. The person was required to pay in cash, they didn't have it. They were subsequently <laughs> told that they would be driven by the tow owner operator to a local establishment to get a wire transfer, to get the cash. Um, it's only gonna cost them $150 for the privilege of the trip uh, to do that. Uh, and then they did it because they felt they had no choice, made the payment, went back to the lot to find the vehicle. The vehicle wasn't even on the lot. And they discovered the vehicle in a private driveway some ways away where they were brought and ultimately were able to reclaim the vehicle. So it raises a sort of a host of these sort of issues around form of payment, reasonable fees and expenses. The one thing I will point out in this example is it happened in a rural area and there's mileage involved. So I think it's not unreasonable to say, as other states have done, there is a construct by which you can have a minimum fee consistent with other areas of Vermont law or say abandoned vehicles, consistent with what other jurisdictions have done. And if a tow owner operator has to travel a significant distance, they can get a per mile rate for that. And that's not unreasonable. We, you know, If it's a taxi service, you're getting charged a metered rate. Um, whatever it is, it's, there's, there is some common usage and there are expenses in having to travel significant distances in order to retrieve a vehicle. So I don't think it's unreasonable to say other states have done this, Vermont can do it too. And we want to protect our um, tow owners and operators from unreasonable additional expenses on top of what otherwise might be a basic tow. Um, so that's a, that's a construct that you all can work with. You're familiar with these um, kinds of elements. You've done it in other areas of, of statute. Um, you could consider doing that um, in the in the towing industry as well. So um, crash site remediation, whole other kettle of fish. And um, I think, again, this is an area where we know that Vermont statute already requires the cost of the, the crash site remediation and the cleanup is actually borne by the driver of the vehicle. That's in the statute. It's already built. Um, but we also know that the tow owners and operators are the ones that are often there doing the cleanup. So they're up front on the hook for uh, helping get the roadways cleared, making sure it's safe for other passenger vehicles uh, and commercial carriers to get through, clearing the space, doing the initial cleanup. Um, and there's a significant cost to that. And each crash site is going to be highly specific to whatever happened. I mean, it's very different if it's a single vehicle crash that's just gone up the road into a snowbank and you're just pulling them out and the vehicle is still operable compared to, you know, a multi-car collision, uh, God forbid, or a commercial vehicle that's at issue that has uh, 
you know, cargo on board, all highly individualized, highly particular. And we take the industry at its word, very difficult to assess in a blanket way or in broad strokes, what limitations or what costs, um, you know, should be applied uh, to the industry in that context. <clears throat> That's an area where typically if you're dealing with commercial carriers, they are required to carry insurance. So it's ultimately going to be likely a question for the insurance company to answer uh, about what's the scope of the coverage. Is it enough to cover the costs or expensive? Have the adjusters all verified the claims and the expenses? And then when is the payment going to issue? Um, but this report is not making recommendations to disturb or change crash site remediation as is currently understood in Vermont. Um, so if the you know, tow operators and owners have concerns that, oh, they're going to impose a cap you know, on us, I don't think that's what this report is suggesting. I think we're suggesting that those are highly individualized costs and expenses. They're already borne by the, by the, by the driver of the vehicle, whether commercial or passenger. Um, and those, in many cases, will be consensual because you're calling out for help. You're calling the station to say, I need help and I, I've got coverage. Um, in some cases, unfortunately, we've heard that maybe there isn't coverage. It might be a, a passenger vehicle and their insurance has lapsed for whatever reason. But I think for the most part, um, we've understood the industry's position that those might be highly tailored and highly fact-specific inquiries. Um, so a blanket regulation is not going to necessarily be the most effective way of resolving those kinds of uh, you know, claims or disputes. Um, vehicle access uh, for removal of personal belongings. So happily, this is an area where I think there's broad agreement, um, both industry and consumer advocates, individual consumers, um, and, you know, in terms of personal belongings, there's broad agreement that really, um, if you left your wallet in the car, you left your cell phone in the car, you left your medication in the car, maybe you left your house keys in the car. Um, the fact that your vehicle has been towed and you may or may not be able to pay the money to pick it up that day, you should not, that should not be a barrier to getting the essential items of daily life. And many, many other states have already acted in this area. I, I think the best practice of the industry, and I think most good hearted business owners would say that's a reasonable thing. You should be able to come in and get what you need to move on with your life for today, tonight, tomorrow. Hopefully you get your money together. You can pay us, you know, for the service that was provided. Um, but we're not going to stop you. Or I think in the industry's parlance in their letter to the, you know, to the to to us as part of this process, we're not going to hold these things hostage um, to to the payment. And I it's a it's a valuable and important concession. Um, I think it will resolve a lot of headaches and make life easier for the average person who's stuck in that position. Um, and it just removes any ambiguity or any dispute over that. It just is a common sense, reasonable thing to do. It's a very basic consumer protection that you all could extend to people to make their lives a little bit easier. I don't think the industry opposes it. Um, so that's a that's an area of commonality and of common interest. So um, nice to be able to have some, some common ground. Um, and on the question of fees, I'll be honest, I think that the industry has said clear and conspicuous disclosures, regardless, is a good thing. Notice and opportunity to understand is a good thing. And I don't think there's a, I mean, how that notice gets provided, there might need to be some discussion because some people may not have a website. They may be posting a sign in the shop, right? This is our hourly rates. If we need three guys to come out, it's going to cost this much. If we need two trucks, it's going to be this, you know, per truck, it's going to be this much. Specialized equipment might be this. So you can, you know, the owners and operators, um, especially on the commercial side or in the consensual tow side, could probably address for themselves how they're going to set those rates and how they're going to disclose them. But you could have a requirement, I don't think it's broadly contested, that having people know what your disclosed rates is a bad thing. I mean, heck, you, you don't, go into Walmart and get a walk out with a toaster without having a receipt that just says, this is what I got. This is what I paid for. This was the rate. And I can check it online. I can look it up. I can go into the store, see it there on the shelf, and I can make an informed decision about whether if I want to purchase that good or service. Many industries are no different. Consumers want to know. Industries want to be forthcoming. I think a little more transparency could be a good thing. Again, I don't think this is a big bone of contention. Details around how and where and, and when that all gets applied, those are you know, questions for you all to answer as a matter of policy. But I think you could find broad agreement from stakeholders that that's 
overall probably a good thing and, and might lessen um, some of the confusion or disagreement. Um, I think we have a question from Sam Shaw. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't. Just answer. Oh, he answered it. All right. You get... hey, Chris. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you go back to the example. Yes. The consumer. Um, looks like Customs Border Protection called the tow company. And then it sounds like this tow company really took them for a ride, maybe. <laughs> yep. Yeah. We're, I, see I think there's another question here is how do our law enforcement that yeah. companies that they're dealing with to make sure that they're not, um, they're not predatory? It's a great question. Um, and I know that um, my, my understanding is that there is some awareness of, um, you know, particular actors out there where there might be questionable practices uh, employed. I will say, I think in fairness to law enforcement, um, it might also be the case that in some instances, there are limitations depending on who is available to do the tow um, and the given community, the proximity to other towing services <clears throat> in rural areas. And so there might be times when there is only one tow service available at a particular time to engage in a tow. Um, I wanna speak for the you know, state police or Department of Motor Vehicles or, or other agencies, but I think there's some awareness that there might be some questionable practices going on out there. I think that's in part why some reasonable uh, rules of the road, so to speak, could be helpful to clear some of that up. Um, but I guess if there's, at the end of the day, limited choice, and then everyone else is out on calls, and you're left with one entity who does have the machinery or the equipment, then the question is, you know, are you, are you sort of left with that circumstance where that's sort of the last best slash only option? Um, and I'll let law, you know, that might be a good question to ask of law enforcement direct more directly is just to say, like, how do you distinguish or how would you know? Or do you have, do you have internal protocols to sort of pause um, and wait until maybe another, you know, outfit becomes available? Um, yeah, it's a good question. You need to create some type of clearinghouse for law enforcement to know who to call. I think they do have, you know, lists of tow operators around the state that they know um, are generally available to them and to the public. Um, how they distinguish between those various, you know, actors and sort of what comes into play in each circumstance might be a question of fact and timing, frankly. Yeah, and when it, you know, when it comes to vetting um, and, and comes to transparency, um, you know, in these situations, should law enforcement, if they're calling someone, be providing that person um, that they've stopped uh, or holding up and having their vehicle towed with where it's going, what their rates are, that type of thing, so that people know up front where it's going to be, what kind of cost they can expect to incur. <clears throat> um, so it sounds like this person really got stuck. It's an unfortunate circumstance. Um, so on the question of um, access to vehicles, the one place I do want to draw the community's attention to that we did look into vis-a-vis -vis commercial vehicles, because um, we heard some testimony about this as well. And then as I looked in deeper into what other states are doing in this area, there are eight other states that do require in some circumstances, what they call a cargo drop. So that's if you have a commercial uh, you know, driver and they've got cargo in the back, either on a flatbed or a container of some kind, um, and the third party is shipping the goods. So the third party isn't, you know, they've hired the trucking company, they hired the driver, but they're not responsible for whatever might have happened that led to crash or a scene where a tower has to come and get the, the you know, the truck itself <clears throat> off the road or taken, you know, to a site. And so there's a question about whether or if that cargo should be allowed to continue on to where it's ultimately supposed to be going in a reasonable manner or whether it should be secured with the vehicle and essentially held much in the same way as like personal belongings might be held in a vehicle. Um, 
I do think, you know, there's some precedent in other jurisdictions to say, if you have, if, if the merchandise is owned by the trucking company itself, then maybe it stays with the truck because you've got a claim, you know, the tow operator has a claim as to sort of everything that's kind of contained as one owner. And so maybe that's a situation where then you do have to work out the costs eventually. Um, or if you, even if you own the cargo, if you're trying to get it onto its eventual destination, if you have insurance policy that you can prove, I've got enough coverage here on just the vehicle itself, the cost of this tow are gonna get covered. It's gonna go through that insurance process, but we have enough. So that's not gonna be in dispute. Now you can release the cargo. Or if there's evidence that the cargo just belongs to somebody else altogether, that it's just not involved in the, the transaction, um, then those states will allow the cargo to move on. But you have to have evidence of that. And there's there are statutory bases on which you can describe how that happens. But it's a good question. It's an important question because there might be a lot of money at issue for the third party who is now caught up in a controversy between the owner operator of the tow and the trucker whose responsibility it was to get the goods safely to market. Um, there is in some ways almost a theory of waste involved. If you've got cargo sitting there and it's worth $100,000 and it's supposed to be in market, you're depriving the retail establishment from selling it, you're bribing the consumers from ultimately getting those things. I mean, all of which is a little attenuated from what you're dealing with at a, at a crash site, but it's a good question. And so we wanted to raise it as um, for your consideration. I would say probably not a sort of a primary recommendation. It's not the thing we're getting complaints about, but if you wanted to do something in a commercial context, you could consider, do we want to achieve some parity with other states on this point and say, <clears throat> yeah, if you're a third party, you're separate apart from this. It's the trucking company, the trucker that's responsible for the costs um, and they're involved in the uh, conflict potentially with the tow operators. If there's a question about the cost or who's gonna pay for it, um, do you wanna allow for a ca cargo drop where that shipment can be picked up and then <clears throat> brought to market some other way or it might have to be disposed of. If it's like produce or something like that, but then at least nobody else is having to deal with the costs of you know, rotting produce the commercial entity that was shipping it can come in and get it and, and dispose of it appropriately. So um, it's just a question and it's one that we flag for you. We put some of the language or some of the criteria that other states use into the report. So you might weigh that as you're considering um, the, the panoply of other uh, potential remedies here. Statutory liens. So there's a fairly lengthy uh, section in here on uh, statutory liens and an examination by Vermont courts of the question of liens um, in Vermont. And the short answer is we, we don't have a statutory lien uh, process. We know that the owners and operators have requested statutory lien authority, which basically just means like we can hold the vehicle indefinitely until we are paid. That is the leverage through which we can get paid. Um, and if we can't hold the vehicle, then the uh, risk or threat to our business is that we will no longer be able to afford in the absence of prompt uh, payments or any payment at all, we will no longer be able to afford um, to offer these services to everyone. Um, and this is a real, this is like a critical aspect of uh, looking into <clears throat> practices in Vermont and around the, around the country, because um, I will be the first person to say that if you are in an accident, or if you are in need and you're stuck in a snowbank somewhere, um, or if your father, mother, kid, friend, whoever it is, has something go wrong with their vehicle, like we all want on-demand service for access to a tow to get us out of the jam. Um, I mean, I think it's just, it's a critically important industry and um, every effort should be taken to you know maintain and preserve the, smooth functioning of towers in our communities. Um, and I've heard testimony from and read news reports of the towers who are worried that uh, any effort to dive into this area, any effort to uh, create a set of best practices uh, by regulation or by statute, you know, might be sort of a death knell for their business. And I, I want to posit like that is not the intention of, of or the goal of this report. Um, or the attorney general, and I certainly hope and expect uh, nobody around this table or, or watching um, wants that to be a natural consequence of any action it might take, um, because we all need it at some point in our lives, right? We all need, we all need some help. 
Um, so the question of payment and prompt and timely payment, one thing is, can you, by adopting a set of um, clear and conspicuous disclosures, some reasonable limitations for non-consensual passenger vehicles, some limitations on what might be charged for storage fees and so on, can you actually make consumers better able to pay in a timely fashion in order that towers are in fact getting paid quickly and efficiently for the services that they're providing um, so that people can move on with their lives, retain their vehicles, and the towers have the money that they need for this sort of the smaller, maybe more day-to-day, -day, more basic set of tows that they're providing to communities. Um, the larger question of uh, you know, major uh, removal of commercial trucking on the you know public roadways, um, I, th I think it's a it's a major issue, um, and there's a question about you know some of the testimony was sort of like you know we're not getting paid. I think the question is what's the timeliness of the payments and who is making the payments? Because I think that again, if you're a commercial trucker, what we know is by federal regulation you're required to carry insurance, so the insurance is going to be there for the most part. It would be a rare and dangerous exception if you were operating without that, and you'd probably be facing some other, um, you know, uh, challenges uh, and, and looking at some other fines and violations if you were operating uh, without that. But for the most part, you're going to have insurance in the mix. The question is the timing of the insurance and how quickly the insurance get paid and who is, uh, whose insurance is, you know, offering the coverage. So I think it's a larger looming question but from our perspective and from the Department of Financial Regulations perspective, we didn't hear enough um, from you know evidence or testimony, frankly, to suggest that in a certainly certainly in a non-consensual circumstance that there's a basis on which to say either in common law or in statute there should be lien authority to just hold <clears throat> these vehicles indefinitely until payment is made. I think a better question might be: Is there something that can be done? Um, through the insurance laws and regulations or in communication with insurance companies um, and the banks and financial institutions, what could be done to improve the best practices in those areas to make sure that there is smooth and efficient payment coming for services that are actually rendered? Um, and there's no question that the services are getting rendered. But I can imagine a circumstance where there's a complicated, you know, crash remediation scene involving, you know, major commercial you know, trucking equipment, and it's a big lift for a relatively, you know, modest towing owner and operator that does have some specialized equipment, and they spend a lot of people hours doing the cleanup, making sure the roadways are safe, and then they're waiting to say, Where, where's the check? Who, who's covering this? We just devoted, you know, after hours, it's on a weekend, it's in a blizzard. You can imagine all of the circumstances that come up in a lot, and Again, highly detailed and fact specific, but I think the question is when is the payment coming and who's gonna be responsible for it? Um, so Chris, you keep mentioning um, non-consensual tows and I, is that, are you only referring to when police have a vehicle towed or are you also referring to a private lot, for example, that has something marked they tow yeah. from that location? That's a great question, thank you. Uh, so. Um, so in terms of setting sort of a uh, mandatory maximum, that is something that these, be, these recommendations we're suggesting would be all non-consensual passenger vehicle tows. So that would be, you know, private lot removal, um, it could be uh, you know, too many tickets that you didn't pay, and now you're getting called in. Uh, some jurisdictions now are just putting the boot on your car so it sits there until you come and pay the tickets and get the boot taken off. But there might be any number of circumstances. Um, you know, you hear stories all the time. You, know, it's, uh, you parked at somebody's house or you parked on a snow day. You didn't know it was a snow day. You parked on the wrong side of the street. And so the tow trucks are coming through and they're removing those vehicles. Those are all the range and scope of sort of non-consensual passenger vehicle tows. Um, again, accepting crash remediation, I mean, arguably... If you're in an accident and you can't respond, it's non-consensual, but presumably if you could consent, you would because you need to get your car off the road safely. And we're sort of setting that aside as a special circumstance because you're either in it and it might be a minor accident and you are calling affirmatively for help 
get your vehicle brought to a safe space and ultimately repaired. Uh, or if you're not able to respond, the police are going to be there and they're going to go emergency personnel and they're going to be calling sort of on your behalf. But again, there might be other expenses involved with that for cleanup, uh, mileage, other things like that. So thank you. Um, so the bottom line is Vermont courts have just said there is no lien authority. You, you can't hold these vehicles. You shouldn't be holding these vehicles. And if there's a demand made for the vehicle, arguably, you don't even get the, if you're delaying somebody from picking up their vehicle and then demanding that they paid for every day of storage after they made the demand, you actually don't even get those fees because you denied them the right to come and take the vehicle. And now you've just run up the meter on all the days uh, that, you, that you withheld the vehicle. Um, so it's been litigated. There, there is that question out there, but there's no basis in fact or in law in Vermont for doing that. And most of the um, authority out there basically says, certainly in the case of, um, there's a great American law report on this that delves into all of the um, you know, towing practices and liens specifically um, across the country. And certainly in jurisdictions where you have a non-consensual tow at issue, there is no lien authority. So they're not supposed to be holding those vehicles in the first place. I know that there's often a negotiation that takes place. Sometimes there's a reasonable repayment agreement that can be entered into, or sometimes somebody can say, be back tomorrow, what can you do for me? Our office gets complaints. Very often there's like a compromise that happens where somebody says, I can only come up with this. And now it's been like the clock has been running and the charges are adding up. But, you know, can you come down and help me out and resolve it? And very often um, owners and operators of good faith will simply do that. They'll come to an accommodation. But the question is, why aren't we doing this upstream in a preventive way so that everybody knows what the rules of the road are, so that the costs can be capped and people can more readily and easily and quickly um, you know, get, get their vehicles restored to them. So um, both DFR and the AGO have taken the position we don't see a basis right now for a statutory lien provision. Um, I think it would um, add to the notion or the feeling on the part of consumers that their vehicles are being held against their essentially being dispossessed of their you know, property, private property, very expensive in some cases, uh, private property sort of without due process, right? That you're kind of holding it and it's locked in. I can't get it. I haven't gone to court. There might be a dispute, but I'm stuck until I pay the bill. And so I just think it's not a good, uh, we don't typically dispossess people of their personal property without some form of due process and going through a process um, because outside of your home, your vehicle might be either the most expensive or the most important uh, element that you have in your life to get you where you need to be day to day. Um, so we don't want to be putting people out where they just can't have access to transportation in a rural state. And then just what's the law around uh, abandoning a vehicle? And I don't, I, I'm sorry that I don't know this, but you probably know. So that is there a time period in which the owner of the lot can claim that the, the vehicle has been abandoned and they can yes. claim that it's now theirs and that's how they're going to recoup their costs. Or is that not a thing in Vermont? It is. It is. And so um, it's an important uh, area that, again, I think with some modest changes and some clarity and transparency in, in the law, should you elect to go there, you might actually see a decline in sort of the number of instances of a title transfer so referred to by the Department of Motor Vehicles um, for an abandoned vehicle. I think the, the fundamental question, is the vehicle actually abandoned or is the person just unable to pay? Um, I'll share with you. I mean, it's not sort of made explicit in our report, but I mean, you're not seeing uh, BMWs and Teslas lose title to the vehicle because somebody just left it at the lot. Uh, my surmise is that the vast majority, about three to 500 vehicles every year, um, titles are transferred to cars, primarily low-income and working people who probably could not come up with the money to retrieve the vehicle. Some might actually be abandoned. Some might be stolen vehicles from either other jurisdictions coming here and they're used for a particular unlawful purpose and then they truly are abandoned. Um, and in those events, certainly the lot owners and operators that have a duty to hold them for a certain period of time, they give notice to the Department of Motor Vehicles after 21 days with a declaration that the vehicle's abandoned. Um, and then the department will try to find the last verified owner or title holder of the vehicle. And that could be a financing agency or it could be the owner themselves, or in some cases, both perhaps, in the hopes that, okay, we're, we're giving actual notice to somebody before the title just goes, we give them an opportunity to come forward 
and reclaim the vehicle. So 20, I'm sorry, 21 days. So all of the daily fees have racked up to that point, And then the amount of time that it takes for someone to get tracked down. And there are still fees associated with that. So by the time somebody actually is tracked down, yeah. fees could be exorbitant. It could be. And, and I think that's, you know, part of the challenge is there are, to be sure, actual vehicles that are actually abandoned. And the lot owner should not be stuck with those vehicles indefinitely. I think that's a fair proposition, and that is well established in Vermont law. There's there's a process and a mechanism for that. I think the question is, um, is there an opportunity for some kind of circuit breaker, um, some kind of a reasonable way to maybe correct a situation for people who truly just don't have the resources? What is the mechanism by which the owner operator can ultimately get paid and by which those owners of those vehicles can ultimately retrieve them for some reasonable cost um, without feeling like, gosh, that meter is running every single day. And every time I come back and try to pay, um, it's like, oh, no, nope, now the amount is this much. Nope, now the amount is this much. Um, and that it's like a, a little bit of a moving target for people that might have a hard time pulling together the resources to make some kind of lump sum payment. It's a really important question. I don't know that we have before us a settled Answer. There might be creative ways to get at that, you know, down down the road in the future. Um, I think, but it's a, but it's a good one, and it would I think involve you know questions about what's the existing process vis-a-vis -vis the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, how can the owners and operators of lots where cars can sit sometimes for long periods of time? How can they be made whole? Um, and is there an access point through which? you know, very low income Vermonters, you know, frankly, can figure out some form of regress. Um, because I think, you know, there's a reasonable expectation that um, that vehicle may be the thing that helps them move ultimately off public assistance, or it might be the thing that gets them to a job, or it might that gets their kid to school or to a doctor's office. Um, and we know that there are a fair number on the roads that, you know, have challenges around inspection um, but that they are meeting daily needs for people, even if they're a little bit on the margins of, you know, keeping them roadworthy. Um, and there's a really difficult balance here for low-income people with, you know, access to reliable cars. Um, it comes up in the context of inspection. It comes up in the context of used vehicle sales. It comes up in the context of these abandoned vehicles and title transfers. Um, and we just know that transportation is, if you go back through any of the reach up reports over the years that have been issued to the, um, your fellow members on, in, in services, they'll always say, you know, transportation and housing are like the two biggest barriers to you know, success. Um, and these days, I mean, my goodness, I would hate to think that that was like somebody's shelter, right? It's just, so it's a real, it's a real thing. If you're a low income person and you need the vehicle the deprivation of that vehicle is very dramatic. And, you know, some of the national reports on this go, you know, paint a very vivid picture of maybe uh, extreme circumstances in this area. And you can read those and, you know, again, but staying away from the anecdotal, I think practically speaking, what you have before you are some sort of common sense consumer protection elements that are co very consistent with other aspects of consumer law that you've already delved into. So the question would be like, could you do something that would make things a little better, probably reduce the incidence of some of that just by itself um, by creating some reasonable limitations and guardrails. Um, and would that help clarify, you know, some of the, some of these issues and maybe reduce that number. Of that? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, uh, just wanted to get back to the uh, reasonable access to a vehicle for your house keys and things like that. Um, and, um, you know, I imagine some of these lots are only open a certain amount of time. And so that, you know, seems like it could be a barrier to get your, your things. And then the other question I had was, um, uh, you show up where you thought you could park and your car's gone. So is there anything as far as, you know, how do you find out who has your, who has towed your car? Great questions, both of them. Um, so one, many jurisdictions have said that, yes, there sometimes there are set hours for tow owners and operators. It's not a 24-7 proposition. So if you're calling after hours, 
um, or you need to have somebody work overtime to come in and help you with that, there might be a modest fee associated with that. And that is something that you can anticipate and contemplate as part of a, a statutory construct. Um, it seems reasonable that if somebody's absorbing extra costs, um, I think you would want to confine it so that there's, you know, there's a, you've, you're going to determine what's reasonable and set it out in statute. So you're not leaving it to somebody's discretion to say, well, boy, if I had to, you know, come and, and do overtime, this is, this is what it is. You could also create something that says to stop the clock from ticking. If somebody makes a call and it's on a weekend or a holiday, or they're not going to deploy, if they won't deploy the assistance to help you get into your vehicle to get access, then it, it calls a timeout on the storage fee rate, right? Because you made the request, maybe even pick up the vehicle, make the payment, right. but they're saying, oh gosh, well, we won't be in until it's a holiday weekend. So it's Friday night, we'll be there Tuesday. You're thinking, well, geez, that could be even, even if you put a, you know, a mandatory maximum of 25 bucks a day, that's another 75 bucks, right? It's three days. Um, and so you might in that instance say, if you're not going to deploy personnel to help the person retrieve their personal effects or to retrieve the vehicle, you could call a pause on the daily rate because the person's made the request, right? So I think there are some practical, constructive ways you could get at that at that issue. Um, and then, the, sorry, the second part of your question uh, was that. How do you, you, you show up to the parking lot and your car's gone? Oh, how do you find do you, it? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, I dropped a footnote in here because I think one of the best, most useful tools I've seen is uh, New York's 311. Um, which is a, a website that anybody can go to. So you can use your handheld device, you can use a computer, you can get from a library, um, and you can quickly and easily, like everybody, all the owner operators know that you upload, here's the license plate, here's the make and model, and here's where it's located. And so you, the consumer, can just like quickly and easily look it up. In an ideal world, in the modern era that we live in, that would be an excellent way to just resolve this problem. It would save everybody time and trouble. The police wouldn't have to take phone calls from people who are scrambling, what happened to my car? Maybe they know, maybe they don't. Um, if it's a tow operator that has a contract with the police, they likely know which operator it is. So if you're calling local law enforcement, they very often will be able to point you in the right direction. Um, but currently there's no requirement in state law that says, okay, you tow the vehicle, this is how you report it or there's a centralized database where you can upload that information and somebody can access it quickly and easily. I don't know that you need in, in Vermont, I don't know that given the time and expense of you know, standing up a new system, I mean, it'd be wonderful if that could happen, but at a minimum, we do acknowledge in the report that there should be some standard. Some states have said within the hour, I don't know how reasonable that is for a lot owner. If you have to, maybe you gotta move three cars out of the way before you can put the one on the lot where it needs to go. Um, and, and you have limited <laughs> staff and really are they going to remember to, you know, I don't know that you'd want to make a violation if somebody didn't get, you know, within an hour, get the car. But I think within a reasonable time, certainly within 24 hours, somebody should have to have an obligation to alert local law enforcement and say, um, not unreasonable to say, we're, we're telling somebody in a position of authority, if somebody's looking for their vehicle, here's where you can find it. Um, a lot of states do that. Um, I'm mindful of the fact that, um, you got a lot of small operators in Vermont and you got some municipalities that they don't have a full on local police staffed police force. So what happens then? Is they all going to go to the Vermont state police you know, or the local sheriff's department? It's a lot of good questions there, but I guess I think where I'm, if I'm picking up your, your question, I think there's a, a reasonable basis to assume that there should be some mechanism by which the owner can get notified. Um, and relatively quickly find that vehicle. And there, there could be a number of options and, and ways to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mindful of the time here, how much more time do we have, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair? I don't know. I think, our, I think our friends from transportation are not used to being here today. <laughs> We start very early. They start earlier than we do, so they get out earlier than we do. We 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 generally will go till three o'clock, but I'll leave it up to. Uh, David, I would love I would love to hear you get to your recommendations. Oh, certainly. I think that's really yeah. terrific. But I don't. I, I think it, this is very useful because I, I'll just say what what you what uh, Christopher has done in 
the work that we were plugging through on our committee a lot last year. So I think we are very interested in this. So I just make sure that we have the time that we need. Certainly. Well, um, so, I mean, the, the really the last two big pieces also have to deal with the money. Um, and it's the question of insurance claims and surety bonds that, that came up. So one of the um, requests of uh, the industry was that, um, again, getting to the question of ultimate payment, um, you know, is there something unfair and deceptive going on vis-a-vis um, -vis the insurance companies? And does the Department of Financial Regulation have the tools that it needs to police insurers that may be wrongfully withholding payments that should be going to owner operators? What we heard from the department is um, they certainly do have authority to act in that area. They have in Title VIII sort of a very similar um, consumer protection law that basically in the banking and insurance sector deals with unfair or deceptive acts or practices by insurers or financial institutions, much the same way that we have authority to act in Title IX for violations of the Consumer Protection Act. So I think they feel well equipped to act and to enforce if they had to. Um, they reported that they are not getting these kinds of complaints. So I think to the extent that industry feels like um, there is some unfair or deceptive act happening in the insurance space, they should be reporting that to the department. I think the department would welcome those kinds of discussions if in fact that is happening. Um, on the other hand, it, uh, you know, it harkens back to the discussions heard around the uh, table at the public hearing, which is I, I think some of this might be a timeliness of payment function. And so there might be a question or some discussion that could be had uh, with Department of Financial Regulation, with the insurance industry, with commercial carriers and with towing operators um, themselves to talk about what do we do about timing and how do we, when, what, what is prompt and, you know, prompt and reasonable payment on a, on a reasonable uh, time frame? Um, that's a question that's sort of outside the scope of this report or outside of our expertise, but I think it's an important one and we certainly heard it. Um, so we want to flag it, but the word that we got from the department recommendation was that they did not see a basis on which to disturb their current powers under Title VIII or try to um, shoehorn in additional uh, powers or authority, um, that there would not really be a basis for that at this time. Um, the question of surety bonds was a one that, again, uh, I'm not seeing that as a requirement across the other jurisdictions that have taken action in this area, and many have many more detailed and many more numerous laws and regulations on point um, than Vermont in this area. I think historically, this has been the province of insurance. If there's an accident or if there's a, a tow that requires coverage in the commercial context, it's going to be insurance carriers that are involved in resolving the claims. Surety bonds um, from the carriers, or shippers and carriers perspective, I think was a novel concept in the sense of when and how um, would we you know, deploy or know that we need to uh, take out a surety bond? Is this for every transport we would need to get a surety bond? What's the scope and coverage of a surety bond? Would we be overpaying for coverage when it's never even exercised because the transport results in a safe, secure shipment and there's never a problem? Um, what happens if you know there's a wreck on a weekend and we were going to get the surety bond, but we didn't get it in time or we're, we need to ship on a weekend, but there's no place to access the surety bond um, at the time when we're doing the shipment. Um, a lot of sort of technical logistical questions about how and when, and whether and if that should all apply. But again, I don't think we felt we had a strong enough basis in which to say this should be an ultimate requirement um, in particular for commercial entities Maybe it's something where um, if the industry and if uh, commercial carriers could identify a set of circumstances in which surety bonds might help to alleviate and might be um, beneficial, frankly, for the, for the industry as a sort of liability protection for it, depending on the you know, nature of certain kinds of shipments. Maybe, maybe there's room for more discussion there. But in terms of a blanket requirement that every shipment in commerce requires a surety bond, um, it sounded like the questions about the size and scope and expense of all of that you know, really came into play. We did not have 
clear answers um, either internally or from other jurisdictions about when and how that would apply in some kind of uniform way. Um, so we were reluctant to offer a, a, a strong you know, recommendation in that area. Um, those were really the key uh, elements and places where uh, we talked a little about abandonment. And again, uh, you've already got a statute in place, so we just give you a little background on that. Um, but that was the gist. We tried to create the, um, you know, a, a walkthrough of the report that was consistent with the requests that um, the legislature made of us. So we tried to do those sort of in order. So as you go back and think more about this report in the future, or as you talk to other stakeholders that might come to your committees and want to continue the, the conversation, you know, you kind of have an order that you set out in the statute and the report tries to follow that order. Um, so if you need to go back and look something up, you can do that. Um, and then we tried to attach as an appendix to the report, you know, kind of the full, it's like 40 pages of, of not necessarily recommendations, but here's the landscape of how this all plays out in other states. So you can take a look at that and see. I think that, you know, the, the biggest takeaway is like Vermont is usually a leader on consumer protection matters, especially in areas that are uh, you know, unregulated and that are significant sectors of the economy. And I think the biggest lesson that, um, you know, we, we take away from your active role in these spaces is that it's generally, um, if there can be areas, if there can be common ground, areas of agreement, and you can remove ambiguity, it's actually usually better for industry and it's usually better for consumers. And so that's the biggest takeaway I want you to think about is like, are there areas of common ground that all the parties can agree on? Are there some simple basic things you can do to eliminate uncertainty uh, and create a basis on which you know people can kind of move forward and um, not have to worry so much about what's going to happen to me in this situation. Um, and that's true for industry too. And I think too, having some a basic framework of best practices can result in improved trust um, and confidence in the industry. Um, I have to say, I read a lot of reports, a lot of national reports, um, and I frankly object to the use of the term predatory uh, or predatory towing, because I think most tow owners and operators are trying to do the best that they can and run a legitimate business and help people in need and be able to cover the costs of the services um, that they deploy. And we all need those services. Um, so I don't think it's a predatory industry. And I think sometimes when you use that term, um, it just creates unnecessary distraction and emotional reactions from people on all sides of the spectrum. And it's not useful. I think what everyone's trying to do is figure out, are there some simple common sense things we can do to make things better for Vermonters, for the businesses and for the average consumer, the average person. Um, so I think that's what you're grappling with. I understand that this is an issue that's come before you from time to time, you know, over the years. And when that happens, I think that's, that is a sign. That was true of the home contracting industry. Um, that was true of, you know, the consumer good, you know, rental, you know, the, uh, you know, business. And so I think you've got a lot of areas where when, when the issue keeps coming back to you, there's a question of like, is, is there room to kind of manifest some common sense things? And for the most part, they tend to be very similar. So it's about notice. It's about understanding what something costs. It's about disclosure. Um, I do think on the payment front, getting a receipt or a bill for what you just paid for is really important. That's a common sense thing that most businesses know how to do. But as a consumer, even if I'm paying a lot for a service, I want to at least know that there was a record of what I paid, what I was charged. Um, that doesn't seem unreasonable. I don't think the industry would say that either. Um, but we know it happens sometimes. And that's not most of the industry. That's the outlier. So can we cure those problems and then get people back on track with you know, what most pe people would reasonably expect? and what most businesses would reasonably deliver. So that said, um, like I said, this is really mostly to do with, with passenger vehicles. Um, there's seven, there's sort of a menu of seven items here that all deal with what we've just discussed. So clear and conspicuous disclosure of rates and fees. And the, the parentheses mean that this, these are adopted in other jurisdictions. I just wanted to give you a number so you can kind of see well, how many states have done this, right? That might be a easy, instead of having to go through every single you know, box in the appendix, you can see, well, most states have done this or some states have done that. Um, 
So clear and cons conspicuous disclosure, again, my understanding is the industry doesn't really impose this. Um, I think the details about you know, how they would make these disclosures, is it like in the shop? Is it online? Different businesses might handle it different ways, but I think that's a not a hurdle uh, too, too high to, to clear. Um, and then you've got the, the issue we've talked about the most today, which is the non-consensual toes. So a limitation of not more than $125. And again, I think it's really important. I, again, I, I won't speak for any particular party, but my understanding is when the rate of $40 for abandoned vehicles from public spaces was raised, that was by a request from some quarters that were saying it's, it's too low. It's not covering the, the costs of doing that service. And so if 125 is the right size and scope for that, and the legislature has already looked at that and decided it, why not create consistency and parity and say, okay, well, how different is it to take an abandoned vehicle from a lot where it shouldn't be or a parking spot where it shouldn't be and taking a ticketed vehicle that, you know, municipal authorities have said has to be removed and say, well, the, the limit should, should really be the same, especially if you're not having to transport it too far, if it's like in town. Outside of town, I think fair and reasonable, and other states have said a certain mileage rate, you know, if it's beyond three to five miles of a, a local vicinity, then you get into, okay, what's a reasonable fee? And you can just look at sister jurisdictions, but I think it's, you know, pretty common, pretty readily identifiable. You could come up with that metric. Um, so that works. You want it to work for people. Um, reasonable drop fee, uh, we think is reasonable. That's also consistent with uh, fixed and reasonable rates for vehicle storage, 25 bucks a day or 25 bucks for a drop. You know, you're basically covering the cost of somebody to go out and check on a vehicle. If the owner shows up, just let it go. Don't give everybody the extra time, expense, and rigmarole of, of trying to retrieve a vehicle once it's been taken away. Um, I do want to point out on the, uh, or underscore the question for you all about, um, yes, fixed rate for vehicle storage, but do you want that to include the day of impoundment, or is that just an actual full day after the fact, right? Like if it's been there overnight, okay, now you've got one day of storage. But if you pick it up the same day, maybe there's very little detriment to the owner. <laughs> Um, and so you can just move on. That might be one way to get the cars off the lots faster and get the owner and operator paid uh, without having the extra, extra money involved. Um, requirement to accept all reasonable forms of payment. I, I just, I've not heard a good faith argument about why that would be objected to by anyone. If the complaint is we can't get paid, we want to get paid, let's make it easier to have more means of payment um, and, and get people paid. Um, again, here you'll see certified check. I can understand there are gonna be some instances or some people maybe even known to the owner operator. It's like, you're gonna, you're gonna float a check that's just not gonna be covered. Like I can't accept that. And that, that's not unreasonable, but if you've got a cashier's check or you've got a money order, that's like cash, that's an instrument, but you ought to be able to pay it and move on. Um, Chris, was there an issue about credit cards or debit cards? We've just heard anecdotally, we and we get complaints about people saying they would, you know, cash only. And so I think I don't think most of the owners are. We didn't hear from the industry like, oh no, 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 like industry standard is, you know, cash only, or we would only do that. I think most sophisticated operators are doing it. So again, it's like a best practice. You know, I think if you go to a fairly sophisticated owner operator, or they have probably a contract with the municipality, like they're going to accept forms of payment. Um, I think the question is like for the outliers, we just make it clear. Like let's let's you know get this get this part resolved. Um, that should not be a, an obstacle. Um, and a lot of other states have done that as well. Personal retrieval. Let's get in line with um, the other states that are already allowing for that. Twenty states offer access to retrieval of personal belongings. Again, not contested by the industry. I think they all agree. It's just a basic. It's a it's a good practice. You want to be a good actor. Um, and this gets to your um, question, Representative, is the question of no, some form of notification. Um, you know, this is, I think this was lifted from one of the other states within an hour of its removal. That would be ideal. I don't know, you know, pra in practical terms, it'd be better to get some clarification on, in terms of notice, what's easiest. I actually think um, for anyone that has a contract with a, a local authority, um, or if it's a, on a state highway, you know, the state police and local law enforcement are probably going to know where it is if it was at the direction of law enforcement. Um, but the question is, if it's private, 
tow uh, or tow off a private lot uh, or off private property, or if it's abandoned vehicle, um, there might not be good no strong notice provisions. And I think just having something clear that says this is how you do it. Um, and again, it might be local law enforcement, you know, to the local jurisdiction. If you don't have municipal, you tell the sheriff's department. You know, simple as that. I mean, it's just it seems intuitive, and we would all like to know, think that that you know would be a standard, but. Um, be a question for I think the local authorities, you know, what kind of a burden, administrative burden does that place on them? Are they able to kind of track that quickly and easily? Um, so you'd want to know that, but it doesn't, again, it just seems like it shouldn't be too high a hurdle to, to clear, to provide folks with some reasonable resource. Um, otherwise you're in a position of people are calling around everywhere and guess what? There's a ministry of time from local law enforcement taking calls from people saying, and then the local police are saying, we don't know where it is. Try here, try here, try there, try there. And uh, and then you're getting callbacks, you know, because it wasn't there. And why did you tell me it was there? <laughs> so I just think, again, removal of ambiguity. Um, and other states do this. Uh, 37 states have express notice requirements. I will say there is an express notice requirement, as we refer to, in terms of title transfer. So if it comes to the end point where, like, somebody truly hasn't been able to identify where their vehicle is at, whether they intended it to be abandoned or not, or couldn't pay for it or not, they will get notice as a title holder from the Department of Motor Vehicle before that vehicle sales. So that's really important, and that is enshrined. It sort of suggests that the state has already taken some initiative to recognize that that's, that's part of the fabric here, is like people should get notice before they're actually deprived of their vehicle in a permanent sense. So, and, and yes, sir. Representative McCoy? Yeah, so um, in my community, during the winter months, there is no, there isn't, no parking ban on Main Street, the bigger streets in town, and there are signs posted. No parking between 11 and whatever, you know, November to March or something. But those individuals call the town office because the town office uh, has an agreement with a towing company, which are few and far between in our area. And um, so they would call our town office, not our county sheriff oh, interesting. or a municipal sheriff. Yep. Mm -hmm. They call the town office and we would tell them where their car, yep. give them the name and number. And is that, um, is that in, pretty well. is that in city ordinance that like, that's how it yeah, works? Yeah, that village, village ordinance. Yeah. 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 So that, yep. that could be another way you could okay. have, you could have, um, you know, the town clerk could, could be yep. the place that gets notice. Right. And then well, that's who they'd call. And yeah. And so then if that becomes like the, the yeah. banner mechanism that's like set up right. in statute, you know, it might be a conversation I have with the town clerks, but they do handle a lot of information. Right. And to the extent that that's sort of a, you know, a civic, a part of civic engagement right. they can assist with, they might be right. okay. happy to do that. Thank you. Not, not a bad idea. Um, so on, on commercial uh, vehicles, just to wrap up, um, very simple, straightforward, but um, Clear and conspicuous disclosure of rates and fees, requirement to accept all reasonable forms of payment. I don't think that's so much an issue with commercial. Uh, and then um, a cargo drop provision. Um, again, I don't. You know, this is a sort of menu of options, and I don't know whether you want to wade too deeply into the sort of commercial aspects of all of this. But I do think there's an important question from third parties that end up having their goods caught up in, you know, potential conflict about who's paying what for the towing service itself. And if they're truly sort of an innocent bystander, why, why, why are their merchandise being held? You know, why don't we get it where it's supposed to be going or get it, you know, disposed of in a reasonable and efficient manner. So it seems common sense, um, but, you know, that's a policy decision you all will have to make. I know, you know, it's not as many jurisdictions that have, um, you know, put that requirement into statute. So that would be an area where you'd maybe a little more testimony from the parties would, would help. Um, and we could certainly help too if it, um, you know, if you want us to reach out to some of those other jurisdictions, um, either their attorneys general to find out like about this particular provision, how does that work in practice and is it effective or has it been controversial in some way? We could certainly follow okay. up and do some of that too. So overall, I think the, the gist of this is notice disclosure helping to resolve your constituent complaints and the complaints that we see on a regular basis, which tend to be average citizens 
uh, consumers, private consumers, individuals that have complaints about the towing practices and kind of the, the not knowing, the not having clarity around what the rules are um, in a situation where they're confronted with maybe a, a deprivation that is causing them some, some hardship and heartache uh, and can be very expensive. Uh, putting some reasonable regulation around that, not regulating the entire industry and not getting into um, issues that might be highly fact and cost intensive to the industry itself. So commercial vehicles, crash site remediation, um, all of those things that are gonna be, have a lot of elements that are gonna have to get worked out between the parties and already do uh, in some respects. Um, and then the larger outstanding question of just like how and when the payment comes and can there be any improvement in that space uh, you know, among the insured, the insurance companies, who certainly have every right to do their due diligence and make sure they're not paying out for something that's not an appropriate expense or not covered by their insurance. Um, but you know, that's, that's a different order of magnitude than the average person who might be calling you for assistance or calling your town clerk or calling the local police or calling our offices for, for help with one of these situations where it's gotten really murky really quickly. And, um, some common sense reforms might might do the trick to help resolve some of this. So I thank you for your time and and I'm sorry to go on so long. Uh, this was a, a very interesting uh, project. And again, I want to thank the uh, all the participants, the consumers and the industry and uh, commercial actors who came forward and gave us with uh, too too much information to reasonably uh, digest in one sitting. And uh, I appreciate your, your forbearance as we took a little additional time to hear from some parties uh, and collect their testimony as the process went along. And I just, I hope fundamentally this is helpful to you. It gives you some information to sort of get you thinking about uh, what is right-sized and reasonable and balanced, because I know that was your directive to us. And we take that very seriously. Um, I don't think anybody is looking to, you know, have owners and operators not able to function. And that's just, that's primary. Because the reason that you have all these questions and concerns is because it's so essential. So then the question is, okay, maybe part of it is getting at this term reasonable, which was what for years has been on the books and what's a reasonable expense. People don't know. And now there's sort of controversy and confusion around that. And if you all can take some steps to help address that, it might go a long way to um, alleviating some of these uh, concerns. So we've offered you a, a menu. Um, I hope it's helpful. And if we can answer other questions, I'm certainly at your disposal now or in the future. Um, and I know that the parties, uh, this will not be the you know, last opportunity for the parties to be heard. And certainly if you take up a bill or if you're wanting to pursue some things, um, they'll want to quite likely to be heard and share their thoughts with you about this as well. So I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate the work that you've done on this, um, Christopher, because, and, and, and also just following really the spirit of the legislation that we passed that was um, in last year's miscellaneous motor vehicle bill. And I think it's really, you did some of the work that we could not do because of lack of time, but also the research and comparing what's going on in Vermont and other states and really the, you know, parsing it apart and also engaging in a meaningful way with the stakeholders. Cause I just want to express, you know, to reiterate, we really care about the tow work, the towing industry. They, they're the, you know, a tow company is the one that pulls us out of a ditch in a storm or takes that wreck off of the highway um, that might have hazardous waste. And we heard a lot about like, the, you know, the, the work that is done and just really appreciate those, fo those folks, um, they're an important industry here in Vermont. So I'm hoping, you know, I think we're gonna be talking with our colleagues in commerce because you parsed it ap apart quite nicely for us, you know, the, what the passenger vehicles and, and commercial vehicles, um, they're related concerns, but I think, you know, we started to, there's a lot about the, you know, consumer protections uh, for Vermonters who are doing this. and. Um, so I just want to express my appreciation um, to helping us get, get some good clarity and a really good document. So looking forward to hearing, um, you know, what the, the, the Commerce Committee think it, it might do and how we might, you know, work.
together um, as appropriate. Yeah. Sounds good. Yep. Any other questions before we finish for the day? Thank you. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Really you're welcome. Good work. Thank you, Madam Chair and Transportation for joining us today and look forward to continue working with you. Um, we don't hold it against you that you sent us the bill, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, uh, I think it's an area that we need to work a little bit on. And we will certainly work with the industry. Um, you said we don't want to shut them down. We want to make sure that they're able to make money. Um, and they do come out um, day or night. No matter what the weather is, we certainly appreciate the service that they provide to us as well. Thank you. Andrew, I think we can go offline.